really talked a lot with you and you're not from SoCal. <laughs> right. Well, kind of am. <laughs> you know, right? well, I mean, but you live here, so there's a lot to talk about, you yeah. know, here. So um, welcome to Cast and Crank. Today, well, how do you say your last name? Key. Key. Gary Key. Gary Key. Uh, we tried to do this one, so he was part of the original Arizona uh run i did but i didn't know how far arizona is and i didn't know well shit it's you know three right. hours this way it's like san diego and like la it's like three hour difference and i'm like oh, i didn't know that so uh he was one of the main guys i wanted to get on with billy so those were the two main guys and i kind of built the whole arizona thing around it so uh and he's one of the boys blanked and, and uh, toxic so uh, i guess let's talk about where you kind of grew up fishing yeah so i grew up in san diego and grew up fishing San Vicente and El Capitan, graduated from El Capitan High School. So, you know, after, after school, we were hitting the sand pits and if we could get up to El Cap, we would get in, <laughs> you know? And one of my good friends, Jason Martinez, he actually got a job working at El Cap, so he had a key to the gate. And oh, so, we so you guys were fishing all the time, like oh, yeah, at dude. night and stuff? Yeah, dude. Oh. We would sneak up there at night and, and fish off the docks there. And we were just uh, addicted to everything <laughs> we could do. And my buddy, Dominic Lozano, he and I, we were just, we were grinders. That's what kind of fishermen we were, we were grinders. I mean, we would, Friday night, we would head down to San Diego Bay. I had a little 12 foot like aluminum boat with a nine, uh, nine horse sea king on it. Yeah. That was my dad's. And we'd go launch in San Diego Bay. We'd fish till like 11 and 12 at night for sand bass or whatever it would bite. And then we would load it up and we'd drive all the way here. And then we would fish all day on the river oh and then, God. and then like sleep a little bit. And then we'd get home like late Sunday evening and then go to work the next week. We're just total grinders. We didn't care where we just fish everywhere. So as being a guy that's done this both, what do you compare like a spotty and a calico to in freshwater? Smallies. Smallies, right? Yeah, okay. totally. Totally. And they're so fun. That's why a lot of these guys uh, that'll, that'll come down from like, um, NorCal, like I'll bring Caesar and, and they'll fill the, the, the sand bass and the, Spotty's biting, they'll be like, shit, dude, these things fight. And I'm like, yeah, that's why I don't go to the lakes a lot because it's an hour and a half for me to go to the lake or 20 minutes to go to the harbor, you know? Yeah, dude, <laughs> they're, they're so fun. And um, a lot of people don't know it too, but halibut are chasers. You can catch halibut on swim baits. Yep. I mean, I've had them come up off the bottom, you know, like in 20 foot of water and, and chomp a swim bait. And you're just like, what the heck, man? It's pretty much the same thing as, as a, a calico fishing because every time you, th everything you're throwing, A-rigs, all of it, you're going to get, you could get at your halibut as well. They're going to do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you kind of had a love for the river or did you have someone that lived over here and that you came up here for that reason? So this is kind of where I cut my teeth was over here. I mean, we had San Vicente and El Capitan, but as you know, at least back then they were closed. A lot of the times they were open like Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday, or some of them were Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And, and until my buddy got the key, we didn't get to go off hours, but <laughs> yeah. my, my grandfather had a trailer here at hidden shores back then it was called Imperial Oasis. Okay. And so we were here. I would say almost every weekend, if not every other weekend, we were over here. And, you know, back then, 70s, we were live bait fishermen, night crawlers, and we kept most of the bass. But, it, you know, it was just fun. Always it is always. what it is. I mean, that, that's how, even nowadays, people keep bass still. Yeah. I mean, it is what it is. It is, yeah. <laughs> but we, we had some epic times over here. And I, that's kind of where I learned most of bass fishing was, was here. So since you grew up, I mean, a little quick tangent, you grew up fishing uh River system, a little more, right? Mm -hmm. So how did that apply to, uh, like, when you started learning lakes a little more? Did you feel like you already kind of had that because you had San Vicente? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think so. I, I was pretty one-dimensional back then. You know, everything was slow for me. Everything was soft plastics, and I was really, like, in the, in the mid-'80s kind of getting into the— back then they had the Reapers. You remember the little three-inch Yeah, yeah, we talked and, about that, yeah. Yeah, split shot, and um, I just wasn't too much into the reaction baits. And then growing up as a kid down here with live bait, it was night crawlers. We never really went and bought shiners. We just bought night crawlers. If we happened to catch a little bait, we would use that. But it was all about plastic worms. And, and uh, I, I don't remember what year it was. It was in the 80s. Um, my parents divorced. So okay. I was flying back and forth from Washington to San Diego. And I was on one of the planes and the flight attendants, you know, they'd keep tracking me as a little kid and they'd always bring like a stack of magazines. And I got this field and stream magazine. So I was just mesmerized reading about fishing. And there was an article in there about Rick Clun winning like his second classic. And I was reading it and they were talking about this man's auger tail worm and like this whole Texas rig thing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I gotta, I gotta try this. So I told my dad, I'm like, oh, I gotta, I gotta do this, you know? So we went down to the tackle store and I got the purple auger tail worms and this little lead head. And like the whole drive over from San Diego, like three hour drive, I must've cut it off and retied it like 900 <laughs> times just, just cause it was so fun. And we got to the river and I walked out in the dock and first cast, I caught like a two pound bass. It's like, 
oh my god that triggered it the, you were done at that i was time. like the magazine the, this is how you do it and it works first cast you know it's so. cool to hear though like that's how it worked back then even i mean i'm 40 i'm gonna be 42 it was magazines i rode bikes so it was bike mag i waited for those bmx plus or, or ride bmx you'd wait for it to come out that's how you learn there was no no internet to like research so you'd be like oh here's a new trick same thing with fishing. You, you were learning everything from those magazines, Everything right? from the magazine. Yeah, and then in the, in the Field and Stream magazine, there was a little card that you could, you could subscribe to Bassmaster magazine. So my mom bought me that subscription to Bassmaster magazine. I still have one of the original ones that I got was 1984. Oh, man. Yeah, it's That's cool. wild, dude. That's a, I mean, it's a long time ago to think about, like, how much information you can get now compared to then, you know? It's like it's yeah. at the tip of your finger. It's, it's right there, you know? But... It's, it's, it's crazy how much is lost in translation as well. It is, yeah. And it, the funny thing is, too, is just like, like everybody says this, too, right? Like, oh, I wish I knew now or wish I knew back then what I know now. I mean, it would just been it was insane. Yeah. But you probably would. It probably wouldn't work the same way. And you probably wouldn't be the fisherman you are now if you didn't cut your teeth that way. Right, right. Because there's a lot of skipping people do nowadays, too, I feel as well. Mm-hmm. And then there's people that stand out like the Matty Wongs that just have it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, um, so when did your, like, uh, when did it all step up? So how old were you when you, when you got that magazine and you're like, man, uh, I'm going to start throwing all kinds of Texas rig stuff like that. Yeah. You know, I think around, around the eighties there just started reading more and developing more, trying to get the tackle that they were talking about in there. And then, um, I would say probably late eighties, you know, I was really convinced that's what I wanted to do for my life. One of like a million people, right? Like everybody's wants that career. Um, but I just, I idolized Rick Klein. Okay. And I met Gary Klein at a boat show. So this probably was like 1989. I met Gary Klein at a boat show, super friendly guy, super helpful, actually gave me his number. And so, uh, and I think at the time he lived in Texas. So he was out for the boat show, but he lived in Texas, gave me his number and I would call him and he would talk to me and he's like, Oh, you know, he, if you really want to really want to do this, you need to move back to Texas. Like you oh, can't, really? you, you can't do it from the West coast very easily. And, uh, you know, his advice, he's such an intelligent guy, Gary Klein. I mean, just, he's a thinker and he's like, you know what? The West coast is great, but you're limited in what types of water that you can learn. And if you want to be a good, good on the Bassmaster tour, you need to learn everything, muddy water, stumps, lily pads, hydrilla, deep, shallow. I mean, all that different. He said, if you go to Texas, you come back here, you can, you can fish all that and you can learn all that. And so in 1991, I, I went to Texas. How old were you at that time? I was 20. Did, did you have, did you just take everything and like you had no job, nothing just went? No, I went ahead of time. And uh, so uh, late 80s, 89, or no, 90, we had that recession and I was working for a construction company and lost my job. So I'm like, okay. well, this is an opportunity right now. <laughs> and so a buddy of mine, we just, we drove back to Texas. I looked for a job. I was a welder back then and I found a job almost immediately. And oh, then man. I just packed my bags and moved to Texas thinking I was going to be a bass pro. <laughs> what was the biggest shock with fishing when you got there? The lakes are massive. I mean, it's massive. You know, you go in San Vicente, you can, you can go around the lake two or three times in a day. Not fishing, you know, if you're fishing slow, but I mean, yeah. you can boat around it. Those lakes are, you know, some of those lakes are 70 miles long. You know, I even tripped coming here driving by the Salton Sea. Yeah. And I'm like, this thing is humongous. Mm-hmm. I'm not used to seeing lakes like that big. It's massive, yeah. And it, there's nothing in there, huh? Uh, it used to be. Yeah, when I was a kid, we fished it all the time. We caught Corvina, and there was a fish called a Sargo that we caught. They had Sargos and Corvinas they in there? They had Sargo, Corvina, Croker, and, of course, Tilapia. Wow. Yeah. Now there's nothing in there anymore? I don't think so. I've heard rumor there's still a few Tilapia. I think Tilapia are bulletproof. I mean, they could probably live in... <laughs> Hey, they eat crap. I mean, come on. Yeah. Very much more than that. I've seen those videos where I'm like, wow. But yeah, it's so big and it's like, uh, it's kind of like no, no one really does anything. Do people like go jet ski and stuff there? They may still. I haven't really been, dude, I probably haven't been in, in <laughs> 20, 30 years. It's been no, it, it was a trip. My kids were driving. I'm like, look at them. Like, I heard my wife's like, I heard it. The salt just keeps going up because the water's going down, right? I think so, yeah. That's wild. Man. And it's fed only by the New River, which is really polluted. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, I would, I would swim in it. <laughs> no, I'm not going to. But yeah. I mean, even but back to talking to the size of the lakes, it's like they have a lot of those in Texas, right? That that are that big. They do, yeah. They, and there's a lot of lakes just in general in Texas. But you know, I fell into the trap when I moved to Texas. You know, you're you're 19, 20 years old, got these grandiose ideas that you're just going to become a bass pro. But 
you know, one of the things you learn when you get out of high school and get a job is like, well, if I want to have a vehicle, I got to pay for insurance. And I want to pay for insurance, I got to have a job, you know? And so all of a sudden I'm, I'm in the grind and I can't get out of it. And, yeah. and I, I would call Gary Klein and his wife, Jana, if he was traveling, his wife would talk to me, you know, and uh, they would just give me advice. And Gary kept telling me, you know, hey, you need to get into the draw tournaments, the red man draw tournaments and learn from some of the pros. Back then, Elton Jones was coming up. Okay. He was like, oh, you could draw a guy like Elton Jones. And I just didn't listen to him. You know, I got locked into that team tournament trap. So on the team tournament, what did you start learning there? Like when you uh, when you went, like, you know, you're kind of like the, the California guy. Did they give you crap because you're the California guy? They did, yeah. <laughs> you know, because I, I, well, I showed up the first tournament with like six-pound maxima <laughs> mono line, you know. <laughs> And uh, so they were making fun of me for that. But um, a lot of guys were fascinated by it. A lot of guys back in Texas, at least back then, the early 90s, they, some stuff they didn't even know about, like split shotting or using small baits. And, you know, their concept, at least back then, was, you know, small baits catch small fish. And I was like, well, I've caught seven pounders on three inch reapers, you know. And, uh, but it works. But I, I, uh, I was really fortunate. I, um, I met a guy back there, older gentleman named Bill Calloway, and he had a Kingfisher boat. And he and I teamed up, and he let me run the front of his boat. Wow, that's uh, rare, huh? It is rare, yeah. So I, I just developed skills really fast by, by being able to run his boat all the time. And, and I've never not run the front. I'm a terrible non-boater, <laughs> man. I, I ask all my friends that own boats, and like, I, I, never, I never stay in the back. I always come up front with them. Like, yeah. hey, you don't mind if I come up here, and I'm just up there. And then, but I feel like you do that with buddies. Like, when I go with my buddy Joe, like, I'm like, dude, just come to the front. Like, you kind of know how to cast, both of you. So you're, you know, one person likes to maybe lob that way one person likes to overhand cool you know yeah yeah i'm comfortable in my boat when people come up front yeah but i know people flip out when you do that yeah. <laughs> um so when you're when you started fishing those team tournaments with them um what was the first like technique texas style technique you learned where you're like wow this is a game changer the jig yeah you know for me the jig was um intimidating you know i read in the magazine about guys throwing the jigs denny brower and the jig and and for me it was um it was a little bit intimidating. And the nice thing about Texas, you've got a lot of farms and a lot of farm ponds. And if you ever want to learn how to use a technique, you just go to a farm pond because those fish will eat a Band-Aid. doesn't even matter what you tie on, they just eat it. They're just hungry and they don't see lures. And I, uh, I skipped work one day, called in sick, wasn't really sick. And I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to go to this farm pond that I knew was just loaded with bass. And all I'm going to take is jigs. I've got to learn it. I've got to learn how to throw a jig. And I mean, I had just an awesome day catching two and three pound fish on jigs, but it, it built that confidence up to where I could actually go to a lake now, like Lake Fork or whatever, and throw a jig and actually have confidence. Hey, I've got fish on the jig before. It's nothing different than a Texas rig. What was the, the big uh, changing curve, if you could remember, like that you started going, wow, uh, I'm not realizing this or the bite. What was that? Uh, for the jig? You know, I think for me, it was just, it was just throwing it, you know, the bite wasn't all too different. It was just getting over that hurdle of being intimidated by it. And I'm a, I'm, I'm always late to the game. I was late to the game with swim baits. I was late to the game with a rigs. I was late to the game with, with the drop shot. Um, I've had a tendency sort of, to sort of stay locked into what, what I'm, what my comfort zone is. And I would say in the last two years, that's dramatically changed. And I think it's changed because I'm not so much into the tournaments anymore. I'm just into having fun and fishing with what I want to fish. And that just opened up a whole world for me. And like, I couldn't be more excited about fishing right now than I've ever been in my lifetime because there's no pressure. I don't even think about tournaments. I'll pick, I'll pick some here and there with, with friends, but man, when I can get a hold of Caesar's, you know, bugle lips <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm looking at this bay, I'm like, I can't wait to go throw it. And it's the only thing I'm going to throw all day. And I go out and I catch fish on it. You, and you could tell in your videos too, just how, um, you know, you've, you've been more active too, doing videos as well after you kind of pulled away from the tournament scene yeah for sure for sure I, I have I have fun doing it and the one thing that I realized is there's a it's not so much the tournament angler that's into the video there's a lot of anglers out there that are kayak fishermen or bank fishermen and I think sometimes we take for granted what they know and what they don't know and I just realized that I'm having a positive impact on people showing them things that they otherwise never would have fished I'm like oh my god isn't that bait too big no dude you can catch 12 inch bass on a 12 inch bait you know they and you're also showing people uh an area of people don't really talk about yeah you yeah. know what i'm saying which and i'm always big I'm, i know to keep your water like especially socal you don't you don't blow up your bite you can't it's too pressured now spots on the river might look the same unless you're really good like you're the locals like maybe billy or the williams brothers they're gonna know exactly where you're at all the time but it's cool for you to give some insight on a different type of fishery that's 
uh, you know, a river fed, not, not, you know, a lake. Mm-hmm. So it, it's kind of cool to see the current stuff, even just watching videos the last couple of weeks. Cause I, I mean, I do a little research and I watch videos. I'm like, oh, okay, this is cool. You guys set up a little different, you know, and I'm by no means a good, uh, bass, large mouth guy. I'm a calico mm-hmm. guy more, but I do like doing it. It's fun. So it's kind of cool to see something where you give up a little information, you know, yeah. and support other companies. That's another big thing. Yeah. I, it's a lot of fun and, and I, I, it's, we have such a good fishery down here and for a lot of folks, they're intimidated by it because they hear about the sandbars. Um, but once you get down here, it's pretty easy to navigate and you know, we welcome having more anglers yeah. come down. So back to the, uh, Texas, when you started learning the jig, you're fishing the team tournament. Um, when did you finally take the jump? Yeah, that's a great question. So <laughs> I, I did not take the jump in Texas. I, um, I ended up getting married uh-huh. uh, with my first wife in Texas. And I was just kind of, at that point in time, I had sort of written off the idea that I would ever be a Bass Pro. I'm like, you know, it's probably not going to happen. And I'm okay with that. I was okay. You know, like, I'll just fish fun for team tournaments. Well, we ended up moving to Arizona. My dad lived out here, so we moved to Phoenix. And, uh, you know, all that was about the time that FLW started getting kind of big. And my, my wife at the time, she, she was like, oh, you should, you should try to do it again. I'm like, wait, what? You know? <laughs> She's like, well, you should, you should try to do it. Because she, she would watch FLW with me, and, and we enjoyed watching it. And I'm like, yeah, maybe, maybe I can. I mean, there's nothing that says now that I can't do it from Arizona. And Everstarts were coming out to the West Coast. So I decided the first year that I would fish the Everstarts, I'd go as a co-angler. Um, mainly because I had never been to any of the lakes on the schedule. They had the Delta, they had uh, Lake Mead, which I'd never been to before, Lake Havasu I'd never been to before. And I'm like, you know what, I, rather than try to go be a boater and just get overwhelmed, let me just jump in the back seat. I'll just go as a non-boater and we'll just go that route. Yeah. One, one year as a non-boater. And I had really good success. I ended up winning co-angler of the year on the non-boater side and made the cut in every tournament but one. And, and it, was a, it was a blast, I had so much fun. Well, back then, you know, FLW was making a lot of promises to a lot of people, a lot of promises to a lot of people <laughs> and, and making everybody think like, oh, hey, you're, you're, you're exactly what we're looking. Oh, you're a family guy. Oh, you got kids. This is great. You know, mm-hmm. and we're going to we're going to get you on a sponsor team. And so I got I drank the Kool-Aid. I mean, I just drank the Kool-Aid as fast as they could give it to me. And they, they were just, oh, yeah, we're going to get you on a sponsor so the, team. So back to the FLW thing, uh, this was kind of like their infancy of coming out here. I, I think so. Probably. Okay. They, they'd already been out a couple couple years. What year was this? Mm, 2005, I think. Okay. Yeah, 2005, okay. I think. And another question. Did you, uh, do you think that te- time in Texas changed your fishing when you came back out here? Absolutely. And were you able, do you think the reason that you were able to pick apart the spots you went to is because of the Texas time? Yeah, absolutely. The te- Texas fishing made me more versatile, way, way more versatile. You know, and you're just chucking spinner baits and buzz baits and you know, crankbaits. I mean, that's it. Spinnerbaits, bubbles, crankbaits, jigs. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, back then in Texas, there, there were some tournaments I would go to where my, my entire tackle was in a little brown lunch bag. Because you knew it was, you just knew it was going to work. There's yeah, no need for anything else. Yep, four spinnerbaits, a jar of Uncle Josh's pork rinds, and a handful of jigs. That was my tournament. <laughs> you just knew it, and, and, and you stick to it. And I think what that taught me was, you know, when you watch, like, the Bassmasters, you watch MLF, you watch FLW, and you see the guys that are in the top 10 almost all the time. They're all doing something different. They're not all doing the same thing. I mean, sometimes they do, right? Mm-hmm. But, you know, Kevin Van Damme's chucking a crankbait. McClellan's throwing a jig. And I can only doing a shaky. You know, and, there's a, and you start to realize that there's a, any lake you go to at any time, there's a, a number of things you can win with. There's not one right way to do it. Yeah. And so the thing with Texas just taught me to figure out what my strengths are and then go find the fish that will meet my strengths and not try to do a little bit of what everybody else is doing. And I think that's the biggest mistake most people make is they, they get where they're not good at anything and they're trying to do everything at once. Pick your baits, obviously with some sensibility to time of year, you know, <laughs> but, um, and, and another thing that the question, since you talk about line, since you went out with like more finesse style, when you went there, did you come back and have a heavier line and go, they're going to bite anyway. It doesn't matter. No, I, I didn't come back like that. <laughs> I came back and got into the real light line again. Did you? Where I learned about line the most was Tim Klinger. Um, that first year as a non-boater in FLW, I drew Klinger on Mead. And we started out that morning. He was throwing a spinnerbait on Lake Mead. It was so clear you could see the bottom. You could read the date on a dime in 40 oh, foot man. of water. That's how clear it was. Yeah. He was throwing a spinnerbait on 50-pound braid. And I'm just like, 
I'm like, don't you worry about the line? He's like, dude, it's a moving bait. They're not even looking at the line. They're looking at the, little bla- <laughs> they're looking at the flashing blades. And so that was kind of a light bulb for me. I'm like, man, maybe, you know, why, why throw a spinner bait on eight pound test? I can go out and throw on 50 pound. And he was catching fish. I'm like, okay. That was sort of a turning point for me. No, that's, that's one I always think about too. And people still do it. And I know it's different nowadays because the pressure has got to be tenfold of what it was, but it's cool to hear people's, uh, opinions online mm-hmm. because it can completely change on how you would do it to the next guy it's cool to hear like what you brought from texas uh, and you came here and then you saw someone do something you know where well you're still doing it and it's that whole uh changing doing, doing something different yeah i i can tell you right now i don't own any line less than 15 pound floor wow carbon. but is that because you're on the river yeah probably partly <laughs> But I, I that, well, no, because I go up to Havasu Clearwater okay. and I throw 15 pound okay. fluorocarbon. But I don't, I, I am not much of a finesse fisherman. I don't, I don't drop shot. When I go to Havasu, I look for the bite that I want, which is usually cranking uh, when the fish are offshore or I'm throwing reaction baits up in the river. Okay. Um, so when you, when you took co, uh, the co angler, angler of the year, right? Yep. Uh, the FL came, FLW came at you. You thought you were going to become Kevin Van Dam. What happened after that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they were, well, I didn't know it at the time, but they were making a lot of promises to okay. a lot of people. They were, they were just trying to get people, well, really what they were trying to do is sell boats. Okay. That's all they were trying to do. Oh, really? Is they, is what they, do you mean? So they, they would tell you, hey, you're the next big thing. We want you to buy a boat. What company were they working with? Ranger. Ranger. Okay. It was all about Ranger, you know. So they were telling everybody, they, they, they knew how to get people to drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> And, and make you feel good. And they made me feel good. You know, you're a good angler. You represent well. You got a family. We're FLW. We're all about family. We're going to get you on a sponsor team, but you got to be in a new ranger. I was an old ranger. You know, you got to be a new ranger, you know. So oh, I didn't realize they were telling, you know, 30 people that. So I go out and I bought a new ranger, you know, which when you have a family and kids and a job, that's an expense. It's a lot of money, a dude. A lot of money. Back then it was 45. I, I got a ranger staff discount and an evanrude staff discount but i still paid like forty five thousand for my boat. Forty five thousand back then is like a hundred grand now like a hundred grand now yeah Yeah. so it was hard on the family but you know we just we believed it we believed that oh we're gonna get a sponsor team deal well didn't didn't work out that way and then they brought the series out and then we spent a lot of money on entry fees in the series and then finally i just washed my hands of everything ranger uh, FLW, I was done with the whole deal and I didn't want to be a part of it anymore. So did you fish the first series? Uh, the FLW series? Yes. Yeah. Worst year I've ever had in my life. No way. Yeah. It was terrible. What do you think changed? Um, what changed for me was I, I traveled with Roy Hawk <laughs> and that he, so Roy, there's nobody in, in the planet, in my opinion, that has a stronger mental game than Roy Hawk. There's nobody more relaxed. There's nobody more focused. Um, he comes across, he can come across as kind of almost flippant, like, like he doesn't really care. He does. He just doesn't let pressure get to him. And I was exactly 180 degree the opposite. And I, I traveled with Roy Hawk for a whole season and just rooming with him and eating dinner with him at night after the tournament and just seeing how laid back, he, even if he had a bad day, you know, he just, he was so positive and that rubbed off on me. So I, I quit FLW. I was done with Ranger. I had some issues with Ranger where the, they didn't warranty some work oh, on my boat man. that they should have, but they kept it back at the factory for like eight months. And so I was without a boat. And um, I talked to Gary Dobbins. I was good friends with Gary Dobbins back then. And he's like, hey, I, I know Rick Pierce really well that owns Bass Cat. He's like, um, let me get you in contact with Rick Pierce. Oh, nice. And so um, I I've called Rick Pierce, talked to him on the phone for like two hours. And he's like, well, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I don't want to fish FLW. I can tell you that, you know, <laughs> I said, I wouldn't mind going back and fishing the Bassmaster opens. And he's like, well, he's like, you'll never get in. He's like, the, when you call, when they open up for the phone lines to register, he said, they, I mean, they fill in like 60 seconds. He's like, you'll just never get in. He's like, but what I can do for you is I'll give you one of the bass cat spots. And I'm like, well, man, dude, I'm, I'm not even, I don't even have a bass cat yet. Yeah. And he's like, don't worry about that. We'll get the boat taken care of later. Just fish out of your ranger. Um, but let me just get you into the opens. And so I went back, I looked at the schedule in the opens and all the years I lived in Texas, the one lake I had not been on was Sam Rayburn. So, (laughs) and I hadn't been on Toledo Bend Uh and the first one was on Toledo Bend. But after that year staying with Roy Hawk and going back to the opens and everybody said, if you're going to go to the opens and you want to qualify for the elites, whatever you do, do not fish the centrals because Clun's in that, and Edwin Evers is in that, and Ish is in All the big names are in the Centrals because mm-hmm. they're trying to qualify for the classic in a secondary route. So like, oh, well, you want to qualify for the Leech, you got to go east or northeast. I'm like, well, I'm not driving that far. Yeah. I mean, Texas is far enough from Arizona. I'm like, 
I, I don't expect to qualify anyhow. I just want to go have fun. That's all I want to do. And I went back to the opens with the idea that that's all I was going to do was have fun. And I, I'm like, you know what? If I grind it for four or five years, maybe I can qualify for the elites. I had no idea that coming in with that relaxed approach and not really caring. I don't want to say I didn't care, but you know what I'm saying? I was more relaxed. I go to, I go to first tournament on Toledo Bend and after day one, I'm like in fourth place. I'm like, you're like, what? Out of 200 <laughs> anglers, Rick Clun, Gary Klein, Mike oh Mc, all these gosh. guys are there. I'm like, this is the elites are here and I'm a half pound out of the lead on day one. I'm like, okay, this is a fluke, you know? And then I think the second day they canceled because of the wind. And then the third day, it was a nightmare day for me. Everybody has those nightmare days, but I went up to my fish and they were biting, but I wasn't landing them. <laughs> <laughs> and I just kept dumping big fish after big oh, fish on gosh. a lipless crankbait. I'm like, well, that's what I expected. You know, yeah. I, it was a, it was a, you know, I had a good first day. Um, but then I'm like, you know what, what would Roy Hawk do? And, uh, he just, he prefishes in the tournament. You know, if it's just not working out for you, go prefish. I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm going to go, I'm going to go over and do something else. I end up scratching out a small limit and made the cut and got a check in that first one. Dude. Yeah. So I was like, man, you were that, that changed your whole mentality too. Right? Everything. You go, yeah. Everything. Yeah. So then the next one was, you were months. still fishing out of the ranger at the time. I was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then months later was their second one. It was a weird year. Like the first one was in March on Toledo Bend. And then the next one was September on Rayburn. Okay. And so I had all summer to kind of prepare for Rayburn. I didn't go too far of a drive, but I just did a lot of reading and research and got to Rayburn and it was hot September in Texas, humid. And I was just, um, I was struggling to find fish. The lake was super low. Everybody was singing the blues. <laughs> And my buddy met me back there to practice with me and uh, he lives back in Texas. And so we're out there practicing and, and it's so, dude, it's so hot because the humidity, you can feel your heartbeat in your eardrums, oh you know, it's just thunk, thunk, thunk. Yeah. and it's like noon and there's two days left to practice. And he's like, well, what do you do back home on the, on the river when it's hot like this? I'm like, I throw top waters. And he's like, well, how come you're not throwing top water here? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, I'm just looking for this deeper hydrilla and stuff like that. And he's like, man, you got to do what you do back home. Just have fun so i got a reaction innovations vixen out tied it on i started looking for offshore hydrilla grass patches that were were the top I'm looking of, for kelp patties yeah kelp patties yeah <laughs> and the top of the hydrilla was about two feet from the surface so you couldn't really see it on the surface but when the sun was up you would see these dark patches like the size of a house and i had fished them in practice and i was throwing different stuff and occasionally i was getting a bite but i just didn't think it was a pattern and so it's noon, he's back there eating a sandwich, and I put that Vixen on, I pulled to this first one, click, 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 boom, it was like a four pounder. I was like, ooh, that's cool. And then I fished all around that same grass patch, no other, no other bites. So I'm like, hmm, maybe it's one fish for grass patch. And so I, I idled on the boat, and we're just idling along, I'm standing on the deck, you know, and he's idling, and I'm like, hey, there's another one up there, you know? And so he pulls it off, I idle, I fire the Vixen out there, click, 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 boom, three pounder. I was like, oh man, oh, we changer. might be onto something here. <laughs> And, uh, so, so anyhow that, uh, I developed that pattern. And so then the last day of the tournament, I never even casted. I just drove around the lake and GPS everywhere where I found a small grass patch offshore. And I had like 70 something GPS spots. I'm like, I'll never run out of water. Um, so first day went out there, whacked him pretty good. And I was in 12th place at a 200. I'm like, well, that's a good You're start. You're stoked. You're I'm happy. Stoked. Yeah. yeah. And then the second day I moved up one spot to 11th. And then the final day I ended up in 10th place. Wow. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. And, and I, I fished so it So the wrong. first one you, you took fourth? Uh, no, I dropped this, down to like 30th. Okay, so then the, this one you took 10th? And this one I took 10th, yep. Wow, what yeah. a huge jump. It was, yeah, it was a huge jump. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing good in the points, and, and, uh, and I fished it wrong. I, I learned my lesson there. I fished it wrong. You know, every, every lake is different. Down here on the river, most of the time, this is a secret, guys, so listen uh -oh. in. <laughs> most of the time down here on the river, you never circle back. On, on where you got bites. You just got to keep going and keep hitting new water. It very rarely works down here to circle back on water you've already fished. The only exception is in the winter time when they stack up on the grass. Um, but there are other lakes like Clear Lake, California, where you'd be stupid not to circle back yeah. where you caught fish. You got to go back. Well, Rayburn is one of those lakes, at least at that time of year, what I knew about it, um, is one of those lakes where you don't circle back. And I kept circling back where I'd caught fish and I made a mistake. And I, I figured it out with about half a day left in the final day. And then I started running my GPS spots where I'd never made a cast in my life before. And I started catching fish and I'm like, man, if I didn't knew, known that to like to start the term, I made it had an even better finish. So, yeah, but I mean, it's cool to see you apply stuff at home mm -hmm. and in different, you know, like, man, this, 
it all works. You just got to find the right application. Yeah, dude. And the biggest, so it's funny, uh, the biggest fish I've ever hooked in my life in a tournament was on Rayburn in that Bassmaster. No way. How big was that? Uh, I'm guessing it was between 12 and 13. Oh, gosh. And it was in the middle of the day. And so, and it, here's what makes it so stupid. <laughs> and, and, I'm, I, dude, I, and I'm an idiot because I knew better. So like every night before the tournament, I would change out my hooks. And back then on the Vixens, the stock hooks were pretty thin, you know, and they would yeah. straighten out pretty easily. So I was putting Gamagatsu EWGs on there. Okay. And so I had this box of Gamagatsu EWGs and I had two left in the box. I'm like, okay, well I'll do the front hook and I'll do the back hook and I'll leave the middle as the stock. <laughs> and in my mind, I'm like, well, that's kind of stupid. You know, I've got other crankbaits that I could pull the EWG off of and put on there, you know, but I didn't, I just yeah. left the front and back. So I go into the final day of the tournament and in back in Texas, there's a lot of gar, alligator gar, mm -hmm. and they'll blow on a top water. And every once in a while, you'll snag one. And if you snag a three and a half foot alligator gar, done. dude, it's done. <laughs> so bite's really tough. It's like glass out there. I'm sweating. I feel like I'm getting heat exhaustion. And I can't get them going. It's the final day of the tournament. I'm in the Bassmasters. I made the cut, and I cannot get my fish going. And my non is like, man, this is brutal tough. And it's just glass. It just feels like death out there. Uh -huh. Air's heavy. And... Um, I'm just mentally thinking like, well, what would most guys do? Most guys would slow down. And so I'm like, I'm gonna do the opposite. I'm gonna speed up. And so I fired that Vixen out there and I started working it super fast. Click, 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 click. And I mean, it exploded, <laughs> it just exploded. And my number was like, oh my God, you need me to get the net? And I'm like, dude, there's no way this is a bass. I've, yeah. I've hooked into a gar because the explosion was so you big. Tell, yeah. I got 50 pound braid and it's screaming off there. There's practically smoke coming off my reel. Yeah. It's just screaming like, there's no way this is a bass. So I put the trolling mower high and I'm like, oh, it's too hot to be messing with a gar. And so I'm chasing this thing down and it dives down into the hydrilla and then it's going sideways, you know, never saw the fish. And uh, he's like, you sure you got, I don't need to get the net? And I'm like, well, it's too far out anyhow, but I don't think it's a bass. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it jumped. And your and my, whole thing changed. And my non-boater just dropped his rod. He's like, oh, my God, that's the biggest bass I've ever seen. And, and dude, it looked like a one-gallon paint bucket. Oh it was giant. Gosh. I was like, oh, no, this is crazy. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely get the net. Definitely get the net. <laughs> and so this fish jumps up. It finally come, it surfaces, and it, it slaps his head on the water. And then I, I see my vixen skip across the water when oh I slapped my. his head. And so at this point in time, I genuinely have heat exhaustion because it's 100-something degrees and humid. And I start to feel like I'm getting nauseated, um, just all that excitement and the heat and stuff like that. And so I just set my rod down, I laid in the bottom of the boat and he's like, you okay? And I said, dude, I feel like I'm gonna black out. So he goes and he gets water and he starts dumping water on me and I'm chugging water and Gatorades and stuff like that. And um, I started feeling just a little bit better. And I got up and I said, dude, that was the biggest fish I've ever hooked in a tournament. <laughs> and I reeled it in and that middle hook that I hadn't changed out, two of the prongs were straightened out. So now, do you change your hooks always? <laughs> I always change my hooks. <laughs> always. And if I have to... Lesson of the story, right? <laughs> yeah. If I have to rob Peter to pay Paul, I will rip it off a crankbait. I mean, I got boxes of crankbaits that had those EWGs. It would have been so easy to just take one oh off and put on there. Oh, my gosh. That's horrible. Yeah. So that, that fish um, would have put me in second place. That was during the same tournament we're talking about. Yeah, the Rayburn okay. one. I ended up in 10th. But that one would have moved me up to second. I wouldn't have won it, but... Uh, I would've mean, been, that would have been amazing on points. Would have been $22,000. That's, that would have been great. <laughs> yeah, dude. So now all of a sudden, uh, my, my mental game changed after Rayburn because now I go into the Elite Series not having a, any idea in the world that I could qualify. In fact, I was convinced I wouldn't. There's no yeah. way I'm going to go back and qualify. With you, you went in just to have fun. You didn't yeah. really care. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, well, crap, there's one tournament left, and I legit have a shot here. And it's at the Chafalaya River Basin in, in Louisiana. So uh, I'm preparing for this and I'm thinking, well, you know, I've never been back there and this is swamp fishing. This is cypress trees and get lost and you better have your GPS. You better have two GPS. The stumps, I right? All the stumps. I everything, heard. Yeah, everything. Okay. Yeah. And it's dark and swampy. It looks like something from the creature of the Black Lagoon. <laughs> and, and everybody said you should have two, two GPS because if one goes out, you need that other. And there's no topographical maps. They're photographs, big, oh, giant man. photographs. So I bought a bunch. Well, wouldn't you know it, like um, three weeks before the tournament, torrential rains torrential i'm talking 10 inches of rain and so i'm calling back there and they're like the river's blown out it looks like chocolate milk it's the three or four feet high i mean it's just blown out muddy mess so i told my wife like you know what? i'm gonna go back and pr put some extra time in i'm gonna put like six days six or seven straight days of practice and really just f try to figure it out yeah so i go back and i what was the cutoff before you could uh before you had to stop uh opens there was none 
No? Okay. No. Oh, awesome. No. Yeah, you could pa- practice for a month if you want oh, to. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I go back there, and it's a muddy mess. And, dude, in seven days of practice, I caught two bass, and they were 40 miles apart from one another. So I'm going into day one of the tournament, and I caught two bass in seven days. And I'm like, okay, well, my Elite Series dream is just <laughs> shattered. There's Where's no that way. positivity at? Come on, oh, man. It goes so fast. <laughs> and like, there's no, there's no way. I caught two bass. I don't even know what to do, you know? So Roy called me, and he's like, well, you, you figure them out? And I'm like, no, dude. I caught two bass in seven days, and they're 40 miles apart from one another. I couldn't even go back and catch those bass in the same day. And uh, he's like, well, just go fishing. Just go fish something new. Go practice more. Practice. Make it your eighth day of practice. Okay. Okay, that's what Roy Hawk would do, and that's what he taught me to do. So you know what? That's a good call. I'll just go. I'll go practice. So I got my maps out that night, and I just picked a lake. I'm like, well, hadn't been to that one in practice, and so I just happened to have a non-boater that lived in that area. Okay. And so he called me. He's like, "What's the game plan?" I was like, "Well, I'll tell you the game plan, but then I'm gonna need your help because I don't know how to get there." And so I said, "This is where I want to go." And I told him on the phone. He's like, "Oh, you got a lock." I'm like, "Okay, what kind of time frame are we talking?" He said, "Well, you know, probably all in from the takeoff." It's probably an hour and a half to get there. He's like, you sure? You're not gonna leave much fishing time. I'm like, dude, I don't even care. Let's just do it. And I got into the lock and there was like three people in the lock. Me, Edwin Evers, and some other guy, I don't remember his name, but he was actually leading after day one. How does a lock, I don't even know how locks work, but how does it all set up? Um, so these were small locks, but you know they've got like a gate system. And so one part of the water is higher. In this case, it was like eight foot higher up, up here on the, on the river part of it. And then we're down lower. And then you come into the gates and they close the gates and then they drain, or in this case they fill, and so then it just lifts your boat up and then they open the top gate and then you go up to that upper thing. And it takes a little while. Okay. Um, it's actually pretty fascinating. And so uh, I got up to that first lake and I'm flipping a, flipping a jig around these um, cypress trees and my non-boater, he's like, he's like, you guys on the West Coast, y'all make the same mistake. I'm like, well, do tell. <laughs> and and uh, he's like, well, cypress trees are different than any other, any other tree. And I'm like, okay, a tree's a tree, you know? And uh, he's like, well, the cypress trees, they have, um, they have the, the, these roots that come up that are like six, <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Uh, six or eight feet away from the actual base of the tree. Okay. And he said, you guys, you West Coast guys, you guys come out here and you flip the base of the tree. He said, but six to eight foot out there, there's a little root, like a b- big as your your wrist and your fist, and it, it'll come up, you know, within a, like six, eight inches there, and you don't really see them. He said, so what you want to do is pitch eight feet away and try to find those roots. Like, I never even knew that. And oh, uh, so, so he told me that, and so all of a sudden I started pitching eight feet away, and I'd find a little root, and I caught a two-pounder. Win. <laughs> Seven days, and I caught two fish, and first day of the tournament, I got yeah. one in the boat. This is victory for me. I can go home happy now. Yeah. I caught a bass <laughs> in, a, in the chapel I River Basin, and I ended up with three fish, all two-pounders, three fish for six pounds, and I go to the weigh-in. There's 200-something boats in there, and I'm like in 40th place. I'm like, wow. So it was bad. It was oh, really bad for everyone. It was terrible, okay. terrible. So the second day I go out, and I caught four bass for eight pounds, all two-pounders. And it moved me up to like 30 something place. And then the final day I caught a limit and I stayed up there. And back then the cut was 30. So I made the cut in the top 30 and was able to fish that final day. Uh-huh. And all of a sudden I'm doing the math in my head. I'm like, I think I qualified for the freaking elite series. I couldn't believe it. And so I'm waiting at the weigh in and Chris Bowes was the tournament director. And uh, he said, yeah, you're, you're in. And so they gave, they gave me an invitation to fish the elite series. And I was I mean, it was a dream come true since I was a little kid. So I was elated. I was out of my mind. I mean, I, I couldn't call people fast enough. I'm calling Roy Hawk <laughs> and I'm calling Gary Dobbins. I'm calling my wife and, and everybody I know. I qualify as the Elite Series, you know? Um, but that was the extent of the excitement. They're, they're, <laughs> because like, and this, this is what I would tell people that, that, that are looking to do that, um, to make a career out of it. Nobody's going to help you. No, nobody's going to help you. It's all on you to do. And I, I just, um, maybe I was naive, but my phone never rang. You know, Bassmaster didn't call me and said, hey, congratulations on qualifying for the leads. Um, you know, here's a list of contacts. Um, here's some paperwork that identifies how we market and what kind of uh, audience we bring to the table at each trip to kind of help sell myself. Nothing. Uh, you think it's different now, though? I, it seems different now. Gosh, I hope so. I hope so. You know, um, unless I guess, well, Maddie's is different because he kind of won 
I guess if you win a bigger tournament, they're going to put you in a pedestal a little more. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think okay. so. But I just was shocked that none of my sponsors called and said, hey, congratulations, you know. Did, did you job. have sponsors at the time? Yeah. When you were in the Opens? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the only person that called me, I think, was Gary Dobbins. I was with Dobbins Rods back then. Um, he called, you know. But um, I was just uh, shocked that there was no one there to help. And I was at a disadvantage, as was everybody that year, because that last open was November, and you had to have your deposits in for the elites uh, December 15th. So now all of a sudden you've got... So you're got, screwed. You're yeah. completely screwed. And I wasn't prepared. I, I didn't go out thinking I was going to qualify, so I didn't prepare with big sponsors or try to solicit big sponsors. Now all of a sudden I've got four weeks to come up with $50,000, and one of those weeks is Thanksgiving week. And this was also 2009, so we're right at the tail end of a recession. So there was, uh, there was no money to be had. Yeah. And so, like when Caesar told you, you know, I, I kind of opted to stay with the family. That's true, but that decision was kind of forced on me as well. I, I didn't have any options. I had um, Gene Cavella with Pepper Jigs offer to pay, you know, like ten, twelve thousand dollars, which I was grateful for. Yeah, of course. But I'm like, I, I can't take it because I can't quit my job and take a risk here. And I think what what a lot of people don't realize, I, and this is probably the biggest thing for me, I, and believe me, I'm grateful now. I'm mm -hmm. glad it didn't work out now. I, hindsight's 2020. I'm thankful for the experience. Um, nobody can take that away from me. I can say, hey, I qualified for the Elite Series. Not a lot of people can say that. Yeah. Um, that, was a, that was a victory for me. But what a lot of people don't realize is it's not about getting that sponsor and being able to fish that first year. You have to step back and say, okay, supposing I got a sponsor that first year. So Monster Energy Drink. So let's say Monster said, hey, we're going to pay you $125,000, pay your entry fees, go fish it. Most of the time, and you can ask Josh this when you have Josh on, most of those contracts are probably one-year contracts. Yeah. Maybe if you're lucky, two-year. And so then all of a sudden now you're fishing the Bassmaster Elite Series, and on the back of your mind is like, okay, when the season's over, <laughs> what am I going to do to do this again? Um, because you're not going to make money enough to support yourself winning tournaments. I don't think. I mean, I don't know if there's anybody out there that's winning so much money in the actual tournament. No, that they no can, one. It's it's all it has to be all sponsors. All sponsors. But now with the sponsors, uh, hold on, it's Frankie, real quick. I'll make sure everything's okay. Oh, that's cool. Everyone thinks I'm a professional, and they <laughs> think I like have notes and I'm ready to go. And I'm like, no, nah, man. I feel like uh, if I do that, I'll mess the podcast up. I feel like it's just like uh, too formatted. Yeah, go with the flow. You know what I'm saying? I no, feel like I, do. I feel like it's like if I had a plan to go fishing. I know it, it never works. You know that? So I go, if I make a plan, usually I don't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Because in my head, I'm making mental notes of like, oh, I'm going to ask this later on when we... You yeah, know? yeah. But the sponsor thing, I get it. I watched uh, Matty. I talked to him a little when he got, and he's like stressed. He's like, I got to make it work. I got to figure out this, this. And then nowadays, you have to promote yourself on social media the same as a tournament. So not only do you got to win to fish the tournaments and, and place and win, you got to make sure your social media is working a certain way. Right. You know, right. which is even worse where you didn't have to worry about that back then. But I could hear what you're saying is like the pressure for, Oh, I mean, it'd be the same with me. It's like, I signed with this, this company for a year. Well, I got to show them some type of return, which could be hard. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, I don't know what to show them, especially when I don't have a product code. Yeah. I'm like, like some, like Atari Phoenix, I try to promote them as much as I can, mm -hmm. but I don't have a product code to go, Hey, they're buying this many. They don't know. Right. Right. You know, so that's really hard. But I mean, for you, it's like, you weren't even planning on doing that. No. So no. you didn't even have a heads up to go, well, if I make the leads guys, I want you to give me the money, you know? Yeah. I just, I feel like I was a realist when I went back and a realist meaning that, Hey, I, I'm a, I'm a solid angler, but I'm not, I'm not good enough to compete at that level yet with these guys. And mm -hmm. Lo and behold, apparently I was, you know, <laughs> um, and simultaneously I was fishing with Josh Bertrand in the ABA Phoenix division that same year. And, uh, he and I ended up winning anglers of the year. So oh, I, I was, wow. I was, um, kind of coming to that realization that, you know, uh, I'm not going to get the sponsors You know, what's the point of going back again the next year and qualifying again, I'm going to be in the same boat and, um, and I'm not going to quit my job for a one year contract yeah. and put my family at risk. Yeah. So, I started planting the seed in Josh's ear that like, hey, dude, you need to go fish the Bass Opens. Get back there and fish the Bass Opens. Get off the West Coast. Go fish, you know. Yeah. And, you know, and, and he did. And, and now look at him today, man. He's having a blast. Right. So I'm living vicariously through Josh. <laughs> that happens a lot of us. Yeah. And he, I, he and I had a great, a great time. I mean, I've known Josh since he was like 15. So Wow. So then after that, uh, I mean, the, I guess the hard part would be coming back and fishing your, you know, ABAs and stuff because you're like, man. 
it's like I, I was in the pros and, and I could still be in there, but I just am not. Yeah. Um, I went through a little bit of depression. I, um, so just legitimate depression of like, you know, you work so hard at something and, and it's a childhood dream from the time I was, you know, eight or nine years old, wanted to be a bass master and to qualify and then not be able to go fish it. Um, it was hard. It was hard. And, and it, was, it was some genuine depression there where I was kind of bitter at the industry, um, mainly because my phone never rang. You know, nobody gave me advice. Nobody's like, hey, you know, I, I knew Bassmaster wasn't going to pay money. But I thought, man, they'll at least call me and kind of point me in the right direction. Hey, here's some advice. And here's mm -hmm. some documentation that will help you sell yourself. And here's some contacts in the industry that we know, you know, we'll make nothing. Zero. It was just crickets. Um, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me because, you know, now... Now I came into it knowing that I don't need to try it anymore. Uh, there's no, no, there's nothing I need to chase after anymore. Um, because I know that's not my end goal. That's not, that's not my end game. So then after that, the, that was what year 2008, that was nine, nine. Yep. Did you come back to the FLW after that? Nope. No, no, uh, I might've fished one at Havasu. Okay. Um, I did tell Josh that if he fished that first year, I would go back with him for the first one. And we did, we went back to Amistad mm -hmm. for the bass opens. And then after that first one, I bowed out and didn't fish any of the other ones. So now from that point on, you just kind of, that was it. You know, yeah. You know, I think, um, you know, you, you, you probably recognize this yourself, but there's a, there's a lot of people in the bass fishing industry, uh, especially in the, in the mid two thousands that were, and you still have this today where they're really, 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 um, aggressive with the tournament fishing but these are guys that don't have a love for fishing. And when I say that is that a lot of people vanished, you know, they, they, they go for the limelight, they go for the jerseys and the patches and the sponsors and the stickers and the rat boats. And then when it doesn't pan out the way they want it to, or some life change happens, um, whether it be a recession or whatever it is, those guys aren't even fishing anymore. They're hunting or they're doing something else. And that's fine. It's not a knock on them. It's just, you, you, there's a lot of people that don't love fishing. Well, I'm the opposite. I love fishing. I've loved fishing since I was a little kid. And so I think the, the elite series experience for me and not being able to go fish, going through that little phase of depression, a little phase, a couple of years, <laughs> right? Uh, especially cause I, I couldn't watch it. I could not sit did down you, and watch. Did you stop fishing for a while? Um, I didn't stop fishing. I stopped fishing tournaments for a while and I got to where I could not watch the Bassmasters. I couldn't watch FLW because it made me yearn for that even more. It's like, I, I should be there. I should be there. And that first one, dude, here's the funny thing, dude, the year I qualified 2009 was for the 2010 season. Well, guess where that very first Bassmaster elite was Cal Delta. Oh God. So now all of a sudden it's like, Hey, that's my West coast here. Yeah. You know, I've got it. And, and I didn't get to go fish it, but John, John Cruz won it, which was pretty sweet. Um, so anyhow, I just, um, I, I got back to the love of fishing and that's where I'm at today. And I got back to my saltwater roots and, and just everything striper fishing. I take my kids out, we go flathead fishing at night. Mm -hmm. I just love fishing. And that's the way it was for me as a kid. And when I started chasing the dream, you kind of lose that love for fishing and you're so micro focused on trying to get there and trying to get there and trying to get there and just scratch and claw. Um, that takes the fun element out of it for me. And I, I hear that hundred percent and I feel like you watch you watch the guys like kind of lose that and i've seen guys like oh, okay i gotta stop this mm -hmm. you know yeah especially the tournaments it's like you're, you're so involved in it and it's like that's all you're trying to do is win mm -hmm. you know and it's like it could take it's like anything else take the fun when something becomes a job it doesn't become fun anymore you know yeah i think of tournament fishing as kind of like a tractor beam it kind of sucks you in a little bit <laughs> and the more you do it the more you want to do it and um the past couple of years i've kind of slowly got sucked back into the tournament scene and then I started seeing that a lot of people in the tournament scene, at least in my opinion, take it way too seriously. Way, I mean, here on the river, we got $50 team tournaments and guys take it so seriously. Like, well, so-and-so's GPS in our spot and so-and-so's beating up our fish. And I'm like, I don't need this, dude. I just don't, you know, I, I just want to go out and have a good time. Yeah. That's all I want to do. So when you came back and you started fishing again, you're fishing the river a lot, right? That's like your main, you don't, do you fish a lot of lakes around here? No. Well, Mitri Lake, okay. um, which is, um, theoretically, well, it's not really part of the river system. It's got a little pipe that feeds off the river, but out of all of the bodies of water down here, it's the only one that doesn't fluctuate a lot. The river okay. fluctuates massive amounts, um, below Imperial Dam fluctuates massive amounts. Um, everything fluctuates based on water up and down. But Mitri more or less stays the same that fluctuates a little bit but um it's the only probably true lake that we have 
So you, but you most, you, you focus on the river. That's your, your love. Yeah. Is that a river? What, uh, I mean, conditions wise, stuff like that. When, when you go in, when you say you never come back to the same spot, uh, you know, in the same day is there's, I mean, the fluctuation of water. What is it? Why is there a reason for that? I, I don't think, again, with the exception of the winter time, winter time, mm-hmm. I will circle back. I just don't think it reloads fast enough. You know, when you go to a place like Clear Lake, California, the the forage is so thick there. I'm talking to Paul Bailey one time, and he said, you know, in the summertime, anywhere you go on Clear Lake, you just reach over the side of the boat and grab a chunk of grass, pull it up, and there's like a thousand crawfish off of it. Uh, we don't have that kind of forage here, and I just don't think it reloads fast enough. So in a, when I say don't circle back, like in a tournament, it just um, it very seldom pays off circling back on water you've already fished. Tournament wise, I mean, how do you break down the river compared to a lake? You know, like when you, what is your uh, go to? You want to give away everything, but when you're going down the river, you know, like what are you thinking? What's your first thing? Like if a guy's like, I'm going to drop shot something like that. Yeah, yeah. Down here, um, you've got two. I would say two trains of thought. You've got the current guys that are that are focused on the main river channel, and they're good at it. We've got a lot of guys here that are good at the main river channel, and then you've got what's called the backwaters. I'm predominantly a backwater fisherman, um, only because I feel like I can separate myself from the crowd. And when you get on the main river channel and you're flipping current, everything looks the same. Excuse me, there's some, there's some nuances, you know, like lake entrances or different depths or different bottom type, but for the most part, it all looks the same. And so now you're just out there grinding with everybody else, doing what everybody else is doing, which is flipping. Um, and I just, I don't feel like it's a good way to, to distinguish myself. Whereas the backwaters, I can get into a backwaters in the summertime. Most of the time I have them to myself. Um, and I can just do my thing, which, um, I like throwing rats. <laughs> <laughs> um, how many different, like, so is it kind of like the Delta where you can get lost in little river channels, like little channels, or is it just a couple? Yeah. You, you know, you, yeah, you, you could technically probably get a little bit lost, but it, it's not that complex. Okay. You know, most of the backwaters, it's just sort of one entrance in, one entrance out. Um, there's a few channels where you might get spun around if you're new down here and, and not know, but um, it's not like the Delta. Okay. I was, because when I, when I went with Caesar, I'm like, I don't even know where the hell we are. Yeah. I couldn't tell you. Like, I have no clue, you know? So does it run past the border? Yeah. Really? Have you ever gone fishing down that way? Uh, I've gone down to Morales Dam and where you could see the water go into into mexico Mm -hmm. and uh to get there where you launch you actually go into mexico and then you're in the u.s and you're into mexico as you go down the river Um, we went with two boats down there and uh, i haven't been back it just it wasn't that good for us that day and i thought yeah so what's your uh your pb out of the river so my pb out of the river is a 1043 and i caught that last year and i caught two over 10 last year was that on a swim bait? I was on a crankbait. Crankbait, okay. Yeah, Lucky, <laughs> Lucky Craft BDS3. They don't even make it anymore. My, my buddy Tyler Shaddy, uh, he lives down here, super good angler. He, he uh, one of the best anglers in, in Yuma down here. And uh, he, he kind of told me just like about how good the crankbait bite is on Mitri, um, but for bigger crankbaits. And I was catching them on like smaller crankbaits, like 1.5s and, mm-hmm. and the Spro Little John and having really good success with that. And, and Tyler told me, he's like, oh man, just bump up your crankbait size. And I'm like, hmm. I got these old Lucky Craft BDS three. I haven't thrown in fifteen years, you know. <laughs> I actually bought them for Clear Lake, so I, I tied one of those on, and I went to Mitri Lake one evening, and it was in March, and it was windy, like thirty mile an hour out of the north, and you know the best day for me to go fishing. But most people don't go, <laughs> and I caught a ten eighteen, and I'm like, oh man, you know. So I'm sending in pictures, and uh, and so then a week, I think it was a week and a half or two weeks later, I went to another backwater down here, not part of Mitri, but part of the river system. And caught a 1043. I had that. I had both those fish on video on YouTube. Nice. And yeah. you, you've been working on a YouTube channel for a minute as well. Yeah. I, I put more energy and focus on Instagram okay. than I do YouTube. I've got some YouTube videos up there. Um, I, I've got the one with uh, with a Goliath gripper that we hand lined in the Gulf of Mexico, which was a lot of fun. A crazy story about that, too. Yeah. Um, to, well, let's hear it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I've got like the 10 powders and then I've got some educational stuff. I, I, I really, uh, I'm enjoying right now just teaching guys stuff about fishing, you know, just uh, different, different tips and tricks and techniques and, um, and modifications and repairs and stuff like, and I'm having fun doing that. Yeah. And that's all I care about. I'm just, I, I'm having fun, but yeah. So the Gulf of Mexico, so I, I moved to Florida for about a year and a half and, uh, my buddy owns a boat there in, in Tampa or St. Petersburg. And so he's like, man, we got to go 
we got to go handline a Goliath grouper. So we had a bunch of guys out, Caesar and uh, Danny were out, but they went in a different boat okay. fishing. And we had Clayton Eastlick, you know Clayton? No, I don't. And Charlie Almassi. Uh-uh. So we had, we had them, and so we go out into the, into the Gulf, and we're like 40 miles out in the middle of nowhere, and there's these old shipwrecks out there. And uh, my buddy Mike, he owns the boat. He's like, yeah, we just got, we got to hand line these Goliath groupers. So we got these big giant circle meat hooks, you know, and we put these, you know, we put a fish on there that's like 20 pounds. <laughs> yeah. And you drop it down on a rope. And then these Goliath groupers are just ferocious, you know. And so we, uh, we hooked this Goliath grouper and I've got GoPro cameras and like go back then it was like GoPro two and GoPro yeah. three. Yeah. And, um, so I've got on a pole and I'm just filming underwater of us bringing this 400 pound Goliath grouper up to the boat. And um, we're excited and we get it up and it, and it pops off next to the boat and it straightens one of these meat hooks. That's how ferocious they are. Oh straightens this thing. And so we're, like, oh, we're laughing, you know. And, <laughs> and so we drop down again and we hook another one and we get it up. Well, finally, the third one we get up, we're doing all of it on video. We get up to the side of the boat and then Mike's like, oh, yeah, you know, bucket list, you got you to gotta jump in with it. And I'd seen videos like Black Tip H where you jump in. Yeah, I've seen that, yeah. And you get your picture, you know, with the with Like the laying group. next to it kind of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh so shoot, man, I jumped right in and we did all that. We got pictures and everything jumping in with the Goliath grouper. And then we finally released it. And, um, man, I couldn't wait to get back home so I could check out the video. And so I get back home cause you know, on the old GoPros, you can't really see, yeah, yeah, see yeah. it until you get it on your computer. So I get all the way back to Orlando. I'm at home and my wife's cooking dinner or something like that. And I'm watching the video and I was like, Oh my God. Oh my God. And my wife's like, what? And I've got, I've got chills, dude. I've got chills. Just like even talking about it right now, I've got chills on my arms. I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. And she's like, what, 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 what? And I'm like, I'm watching the video when we were pulling that Goliath grouper up, and there's two giant bull shark underneath of it. We never even knew they were there. And of course, our dumbasses, we just jump right in the ocean to get our picture taken with this Goliath grouper, and had oh no clue gosh. that these bull sharks were down there. And so I've got that video on YouTube, and you can see like, it's, oh yeah, well I'll put it, pull it off there, and put it up so yeah, people dude, can see it. It's like at cool. the four twenty mark or something, oh. and I put a circle on it. You can see these, and they're big bull sharks, dude. And bull sharks are they these, would go right after you. Yeah, dude, they're like no joke. <laughs> I don't know if they're the most aggressive, but I've heard that bull shark. You just don't mess with bull sharks. Well, they're the ones that swim up the channels, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that can get in the fresh water. Yeah. That's the ones everyone's scared of. <laughs> yeah, I'm scared of them. Did you uh, largemouth fish down there? I did. Yeah. Yeah. How was that? It's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. I, I um, the fish are ferocious. Florida strain bass. Um, good buddy of mine, uh, Nate Bloom and Joey Bloom. I happened to meet up with them and and solid anglers, just really good good anglers. I think Nate just won a boat in MLF on the, on the co angler side. Wow. And uh, they taught me a lot about Florida. Okay. And, um, I, I had such a blast down there, but I didn't have success at first in Florida cause I fished it wrong. And Nate and Joey kind of taught me how to fish it correctly. And they said, you know, it was kind of like that story on the, on the Chafalaya river basin where the West coast guys do it all wrong. And, yeah. and, and Nate and Joey are both like, you guys, every time you guys come here, you do it wrong. And I'm like, well, what are we doing wrong? Tell me, tell me, tell me. <laughs> He's like, you come down here and you look for the grass. Cause that's what you do on the West coast. Yeah. You look for the grass cause the grass is where the bass are. And he's like, in Florida, everything is grass. There's like 1900 million different strains of grass everywhere yeah he said you gotta look for the shell beds he says all these videos you see of like the elite series guys and they're you know they're punching grass they are but they're on the edge of a shell bed they're on some kind of hard bottom and so they started showing me on the graph like you just you'll be going along and all you see is grass 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 and all of a sudden nothing that's where you want and that's where you want to be and it's like just shells like seashells yeah and these bass will stack on these shell beds and they're not easy to find but once they taught me that yeah, I was going out there throwing LV 500s <laughs> and the shell beds and underspins and and cracking some cracking some giants. It was a lot of fun. That seems that'd be a game changer. Um, what about swim baits? When did you kind of get into that? So yeah, so like I, that's a good question. So like I mentioned before, I'm always late to the game. Just I'm terribly late to the game. Um, I got into swim baits a few years after the baby E came out. Everybody's whacking them on swim baits, you know, um, you know Sean and. Matt Newman and, and all those guys. By the way, Matt told me to tell you hello. Oh, yeah, I love Matt. He's a great dude. Yeah, dude. He's awesome, <laughs> man. And I, lo- I love the IROD team. We're, just, we're so much fun. It's such a fun team to be on, and uh, I love them. Everybody's so great. But, um, you know, all those guys are throwing swim baits, and I was just so late to it. And I wanted to throw them, but, you know, I just locked into what I like to do. And so I came down here to the river with, you know, four or five baby E's, and I'm like, well, you know what? I'll just do what I always do when I need to learn something. That's the only thing I'm going to take with me in the boat. So I put the four baby E's in the boat, got rid of every other rod, and I went out with the baby E, and it was the line through with the treble on the bottom. Okay. 
pull into a backwater, and I caught a bluegill. I caught a bluegill <laughs> on a baby e swim bait. What a, what a story! You and go to catch a, a big bass, and you catch. I just I thought it was fouled or something because it was like fighting kind of weird. I'm like, yeah. what's this wrong with this swim bait? You know, and somehow that bluegill got that treble, like too right. hot treble, whatever it was. <laughs> I'm like, this can't, this can't be happening to me. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyhow, um, I ended up catching quite a few fish that day on the baby E. So that sort of opened up that window for me for swim baits, but swim baits and all those big baits at that point in time, up until a couple, couple, two, three years ago were still novelties for me. It's like, yeah, you know what? The swim bait thing is fun, but I would never do it in a tournament with the exception of like a skinny dipper. You know, I don't even count that. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Baits, but anything big was a novelty thing for me. Um, and that's kind of how I got onto the rat. Um, and that's my thing now is the rat. It's all about the rat for me. I, um, I went out with the rat. I had it in the boat and I, you know, it, it's a novelty thing. And it was kind of one of those things like, well, I've never do it in a tournament, but if the timing's perfect, it's late in the evening or early in the morning, I might throw it. So me and my buddy Brandon were in Ferguson Lake and we're fishing an area that's really good normally for that time of year. Mm-hmm. And we're back there, we're throwing swim jigs and frogs and, and little swim baits and stuff. And we fished this whole area out, never got a bite. Like, oh man, kind of sucks, getting late. You know, we probably need to go back in anyhow. And I had that rat on deck, had the 50 size Spro on deck. Ah, what the hell, I'll throw it, you know? So I picked it up, fired it out there and it hit the water. And immediately there was like a swirl. I'm like, I must've spooked a carp or something. There's not <laughs> a bass. So I reeled it in, I fired it out there again and got three cranks on it and caught like a five and a half. I'm like, dude, we just fished this area. Yeah. And got no bites and all of a sudden, the, they bit this rat. Well, still, it's a novelty thing for me. And that very next weekend, uh, my wife wanted to go fishing with me. The weather was good. She'll go with me if the weather's good. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to throw a rat all day. That's it. I'm going to throw the rat all day. So I got the Spro size 40, and I threw it all day. And I had like 24 pounds. I wow. crushed. I cracked them all day long. Middle of the day. Was that on that lake? Same lake? Uh, the whole river system. Oh, the whole I, river system. Yeah, okay. dude. I was going into like backwaters and stuff. And I cracked like 24 pounds and I was catching them early in the morning, mid morning, late morning, middle of the day, late afternoon. So what, what, what do you think you, you found that made it bite? The rat has so much drawing power. It pulls them out of cover because they're mesmerized by it. Um, you know, I'm one of those people, um, and there's a few of us out there that I'm, I'm not real big on colors. And I'm not, I'm, I don't get wrapped up in colors. Um, I'm not real wrapped up on how realistic a bait has to necessarily look. But I do think that bass know the difference between a terrestrial and a non-terrestrial. Mm-hmm. I think a bass knows when he sees a gizzard shad, uh, the first thing that bass thinks is, oh, crap, that's going to be a lot of effort. <laughs> that is a lot of work to go okay, chase that make, dumb that's thing That's a down. great theory. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think a bass knows that when it, it's a terrestrial, like a rat or a rodent or something like that, that that rodent has no clue that fish is down there, and he doesn't even try to get away. So mm-hmm. the bass, almost every strike that I get on the rat, almost, is non-aggressive. So do you do you throw the rat more than you would throw a regular like glide or anything like that? No, oh, dude, I throw the rat all the time. Really? Okay. All the time. I mean. So do you do you have like a, a huge variety? I do. I and think do you I, look for certain sizes at certain times of the day, stuff like that? I do. Um, I think I own forty rats. Wow. Yeah. So that's your deal. You're like that's the, you're. My you, friends call me the Rat Whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> that's the name of this episode. The Rat Whisperer. The Rat Whisperer. Yeah. Um, I don't know how I got that name, but I, I throw it a lot and I have confidence in it a lot. And I've won, I think in the last three years, almost $9,000 on the rat. On a rat. On a rat. Okay. What's your favorite rat? So I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. And there's two answers <laughs> to that question. If I'm in a tournament and there's money on the line, I'm throwing the Spro. Okay. I am just throwing the Spro rat because it, um, I've won so much money on it. It's, it's proven. It's durable. Um, and I don't lose a lot of fish. I rarely lose fish on the rat. And I have some theories on why, why, why you don't lose a lot of fish on the rat. I've got some, so I thought what I could, could consider scientific theories. No, I'd love to hear them. Like, um, this is what we're here to talk about. You know, a lot of guys, um, when we talk about the rat, a lot of guys are, 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 um, discouraged because the majority of the fish are on the back hook and it makes them nervous. Mm-hmm. And that's the best thing that could ever happen is that you only hook the fish on the back hook. Um, because he, he's on the back hook and then the, he's got that pivot point in the rat and that allows it to flex and they just don't come off. And you start getting them in both hooks or just the front hook, you're at a higher risk of them you got a pivot point, the bait. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You lose that pivot and, um, the bait locks in. It's like throwing a, a, a super spook, you know, you yes. lose fish on it because yeah. it's just one solid, solid bait. So, um, and, and because they, 
like I said, I, I believe the bass knows what a terrestrial is and they don't hit it real aggressively. Almost every bite, you're just reeling the rat and all of a sudden it just goes under. They just come up behind it and they just pull it under. They just know. They just know, hey, it's not going to try to get away from me. It makes complete sense to me. Like, uh, makes complete sense to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the Spro for me is the go-to in a tournament. But my favorite rat to throw, it's hard to pick a favorite. I, uh, George Pernicano's PB rat is insane. Okay. I love that rat. There's so much commotion, so much action. And I've caught a lot of big fish on the PB rat. Um, guy named... Uh, uh, Douglas Livingston owns Gator Dog okay. out of Georgia, and he makes a chipmunk. And the paint job, dude, is insane. It looks like a chipmunk. And I just got onto that this year. He just came out with it, and he sent me one. And I've been murdering him on the chipmunk. It's stupid. And and that and I my hookup ratio on the chipmunk's really high, and so I'm throwing I'm throwing it in tournaments too. If you're in the current and you're on the river systems, are you throwing along the tule edges, stuff like that? I am, yeah. And it, it's um, the Spro is a little bit unique than most other rats in that it has two sounds to it. It's got a single ball knocker in it, so it's making that knocking sound. But then also because of the plastic and the way it swims, those, when the sides hit, you get that extra knock. So there's like a double knocking sound with that Spro, um, and that helps uh, in a little bit more stained water, and it calls them out of deep water. Yeah. And so uh, this year I went up uh, towards Havasu to, to Parker and I was catching small, I'm going to be posting some videos, but I was catching smallies that were swimming up out of 13, 14 foot of water to eat the rat on the surface in the middle of the day with jet boats and wake boats pounding the shoreline. Wow. Um, there's a restaurant called Fox something or other on Parker uh -huh. and there's like an outdoor bar and we pulled up there and there's people out there drinking. They have a live band playing. You can feel the music in the boat vibrating on the water. There's two foot chop banging up against the bank and my boat's in like 15 foot of water and I'm catching three and four pound smallies on a rat. They just wanted it. They just it, murdered it. It was that, it. it looked like an easy meal. It, yeah, <laughs> it was crazy. And smallies, unlike largies, they're super aggressive on the rat. So I've caught stripers on rats, I've caught smallies on rats, I've caught, well, of course, largies on rats. Um, my buddy Tyler Shaddy and I, we won the Wild West Bass last year no way. on Havasu, and um, that's all we threw all day. Rats. We threw rats. So then what's the setup? What's your setup for these rats? So I'm working with iRod right now on, on a rat rod, um, Gary's rat rod. I feel like with three years now into throwing the rat and really dialing in kind of the, the dynamics of a rod, um, I think I've got it down to the perfect rod. So we should be coming out with, with a rat rod. Hopefully this year, you know how supply chain is, might yeah, be might oh. be spring of next year, yeah. um, but it's gonna be a seven foot 10 sort of parabolic rod. You know, I, I think of the rat kind of like a crankbait. You need that parabolic rod. You don't want a rod that's too stiff. Uh, and then when you have a, like a medium type action rod like that, your castability is a little bit better. Um, I throw them on 50 pound braid exclusively. I never run a leader on a rat. And glide baits, I will run like a 30 pound fluorocarbon leader sometimes. Uh, as long as it's the leader material. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know a lot of guys know that, but leader material is a little bit different than just straight fluorocarbon line. Uh, and it has a little bit more stretch and give to it. Um, but with a rat, just straight straight braid. Um, but the, the, the bigger rats, like the PB, I'm throwing on the iRod Kaimana 804, um, the, the medium action rod. Great it's, rod. Yeah, yeah, it's such a good rod, and it works good for those rats. But um, it's addicting for me. On the smaller rats, are you using 794? Um, yeah, I'm using right now the Kaimana 793 Pose Reaction oh, Rod. Oh, really? Yeah. 794 is like my all-time favorite eye rod. Like, I had three of them. Oh, nice. I just loved them for everything. I'd throw everything on it. Yeah. Like, it was a perfect blend of all of them. Perfect blend, yeah. 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 So so my rat rod's going to be a 710 three-power. Okay. Yeah. Wow, that'd be great. Oh, dude, it's going to yeah. be so, so rad for that rat. Um, I, I, dude, I, I, when I say I'm addicted to the rat, I'm, that's no joke, dude. I, I, I um... <laughs> It's all I want to do. So it's, like maybe 40% of the time you're throwing the rat? More than that, dude. When you're fishing, you're just like dialed I in. I, yeah. I mean, I can't tell you how many tournaments that I've fished where I started the day and ended the day with a rat. When we won that Wild West, I had two rods on the deck. I had a size 40 <laughs> rat and a size 50 rat. Wow. And then Tyler had a 40 rat. And then we had a, we always keep a follow-up bait. You know, yeah, you yeah. have to. Yeah. Um, either a Senko. I like the Missile 48 worm. It's a, it's a 4.8 inch worm. It's okay. a little bit narrower in the middle. And so when that, because it's narrow in the middle, it kind of shimmies a little bit more when it falls. And then Ica's are always good, but always mm -hmm. have a follow-up bait on the, on the deck for the rat. Um, and, and most of the time you'll, you'll get them, but, um, I what about real, what real are you liking to use on that? You know, I, um, I've been sort of a diehard Garcia guy. Um, I was on the pure fishing team when I was fishing the bass opens mm -hmm. 
and so I've just gotten to where I'm really super comfortable with the Garcia reels, but um, I'm starting to expand now because uh, I don't really have, I have iRod as a sponsor, I have Spro, and I have Missile Baits. Okay. And that's it. And, and that's just my presence on social media, and I really, I really appreciate them, and I don't want a lot of sponsors. Um, I just, I want to go with what I believe in. Um, Missile Baits team's great, John and, and Byron Childers, just they're good people, and I'm stoked to be a part of that team. Spro, they have so many baits that I already throw anyhow, uh, and they're tied with Gamakatsu, which is the only hook I throw. Yeah, yeah. Um, so on the reels, I'm just expanding a little bit more with the Daiwas, and um, I've got a, a lose that I've tried on some of the bigger rats. Every, everybody hates lose. I don't know why. Yeah, you know, my, my buddy Dom Lozano, Dominic Lozano, he's a SoCal guy, but he lives in Texas uh-huh. right now. He turned me on to the extra wide spool. Um, it's been a solid reel. The only thing I would say is that I've been having a little bit of issue with the thumb bar being hard to depress. And so I'm gonna have to send it back, and they're gonna have to I, rework I, it. I had a uh, the 200 size a super spool, the black one, uh-huh. for seven years in the salt, and I'd rinse it off, and never had an issue. Nice. So I went. I actually changed. So I'm changing my salt stuff back to lose. Uh-huh. So I got it. I think I bought the 300. I got it for Father's Day, and then uh, I bought another two 200s. But I use all my freshwaters Daiwa. I, I love the T wing. It's like you can cast that thing a mile, man. Yeah, dude. Yeah, <laughs> I've got a few dollars I really like. You know, and for a gear ratio on the rat, I almost always throw eight to one. Fast. I, I can slow it down okay. if I need to, but I, I just, um, my style of fishing is covering a lot of water fast all the time and never, never slowing down. And so, um, if I make a bad cast, I just, I need to be able to get it in and make another cast. Makes sense. Yeah. Do you, um, <clears throat> let's also talk about, this is something super cool. I'm like, Hey, have you ever done a podcast before? And you're like, uh, yeah, I had one. I'm like, no way. Talk about that and how that came apart. And then, you know, kind of became too much work or stuff like that yeah dude um we did we had a podcast called fish recon podcast um we ran two years we had some really cool guests on there um captain dave marciano from wicked tuna he was a blast uh, tj ott we did live at icast and we had um tyler from the pinwheel on and we had um uh wild bill from deadliest catch nice. what made you want to start a podcast you know, at my job, there was this, this kid that I used to work with, and he started a podcast called The, the Men's Podcast, and it had nothing to do with fishing. Yeah. Um, but he kind of hit it big real quick, and they were generating cash. He, he was getting like 2500 bucks a month. I'm like, wow. Wait a minute. You're getting Just from listened? Just from like sponsors? Oh, and okay. Yeah. And I'm like, 2500 bucks a month for talking? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, dude. And, he, and so he got me like all so excited about it. And like, yeah. Well, man, I've got a lot of years of experience fishing. I got a lot to talk about, saltwater, freshwater, and, and a lot to learn, too. You learn from your guests. Oh, heck yeah. And um, so I, I called my buddy Jimmy Savuini, and we talked through it, and we decided to start this podcast. So I, we started it and, and uh, picked up a couple sponsors, made a little bit of money. Not, well, not then, t- then you figured this out. The fishing industry doesn't give a shit about podcasts. Right, right. <laughs> and they don't really care. I mean, I, I think that's another thing. The fishing industry is so different. Uh, and I'm not complaining. Like, I'm, we're doing okay. I'm happy. We, we get to do this. The podcast helps us do this and travel and get Airbnb. But I feel like if you, you did something like a comedy or something like that, it's so much easier to, like, actually uh, make money. Yeah. Because like, it's like it's like your sponsor's like we talked right. about absolutely same thing i mean if you have a podcast and you're giving people real estate advice you're probably making <laughs> tens of thousands yeah, a month or yeah. whatever it is yeah. or diet <laughs> dietary food what a supplement i mean yeah. i don't know but i i just um so we ran it we had a good time we, we learned a lot we had some fascinating guests and my favorite part of the whole thing was just the stories i mean we had one guy on there that was a avid fly fisherman he's on a cruise boat and there's a banquet going on he's in a tuxedo and he disappears and he goes and gets his fly rod on the back of the cruise boat and he hooks into like a black marlin oh my on a gosh. fly rod. Yeah, in a tuxedo. <laughs> and so there's like all these stories and yeah. I, I'm like, God, I love fishing. I love fishing, I love the stories. And, and we had um, George Cook on who's with, uh, I don't remember what it is, but big West Coast fly guy, Alaska. Okay. And he's talking about you know fishing in Alaska and why the trout are so big and healthy there and, and um, brown trout in Argentina. I mean, we just had, we had great guests, but um, we just got to the point where it was, it's so much work, dude. My, my hat's off to you for doing this Thanks. because it's such, it's so much Were you much putting work. out one a week? Um, dude, I think we did one a month. Really? I think we did one a month. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't think I did one a week. Yeah. <laughs> I might have, I don't remember. I just remember it was a lot of work. Yeah. You know, just the editing and, um, 
uh, maybe I was, maybe I didn't need to edit as much, but I'm like a control freak and yeah, like, I'm, I'm like meticulous, like every little, you know, cause you, you get guests on there that have uh, what I call verbal clauses. Some people that like say, you know, like 10,000 times, like, you know, you know, you know. And so all of a sudden I found myself like, okay, well there's eight, you knows in a row. I can take them all out, but one. And then all of a sudden you're, you're picking apart the podcast and all of a sudden I'm six hours in and I'm like, oh, for crying out loud, it's an hour long podcast and it just took me six hours to edit. And uh, I got to the point I couldn't, I couldn't sustain it, not generating any kind of revenue. That's the hard part is generating the, the proper revenue and, you know, getting, getting it that way. But it's like, I don't know. I don't know. It's like, like I said, we'll see how, how it goes. Well, when my goal is five years. <laughs> nice. Well, when I started missing out on fishing because I'm at home editing podcasts, I'm like, I have a fishing podcast and I'm not even fishing. I'm at home editing. I hear you. Like <laughs> I said before the podcast, I'd fish twice a week in my boat. Now, once every two weeks, you know, maybe. Yeah. Depending if, I mean, like, this is nice. Like I always say, when I travel, it knocks out five podcasts. Mm -hmm. So I don't got to worry for about a month and a half. Oh, good. You good. know, for guests so I could schedule for late July or whatever it might be. Right. And some here and there. So it's kind of nice. But um, let's plug all your sponsors Let's uh, uh, so people can hear anything that you support. Yeah. So I partnered with iRod. Um, I've been with iRod for a few years now. Great, great team and good set of rods. And it was a, it was a partnership that was just meant to be. I've known Matt for a long time. He's a great guy. I've always Amazing. Had good, yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. Great. Had a great relationship with him. And, and, um, so when I finally joined with iRod, it was just like, Hey, it makes sense for both of us. Cause I do both salt and fresh water and Matt makes both salt and fresh water rods and yeah. he makes good rods. Um, and what I really like about them is just, um, you know, the, the, the partnership and, and him helping me develop a rat rod and, and we're going to come to market with it and it's going to be a lot of fun. And then, uh, missile baits. I just, um, I, uh, I, I flip down here. That's mostly what I do. And I have a follow-up bait for my rats. That's the extent <laughs> of my soft plastics and missile makes the baits that I like the D bomb. Uh, like I told you before, I'm not real big on, on colors or, you know, well, it's gotta be this bait with this amount of glitter in it. Yeah. I just, you know, basic colors. Yeah. And then, uh, and then Spro. So that's pretty much the extent. It's cool to hear you. You pretty much say, "This is what I fish. This is what I'm sponsored by." That's it. That's it. That's it. I've been approached by some other sponsors, and I've turned them down. You know, I just say, "Hey, you know what? I appreciate it, but um, I just do what I do, and I, I don't want to get into a position where I feel pressured to have to promote something that I don't genuinely believe in." And so I knew going into Missile, I believed in their product. I'm, I throw it. And if I have to pay for it, I'm fine to pay for it. Yeah. Um, and when they put me on the missile team, you know, Byron, Byron, he's the director of the, of the staff. He's director of sales. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he, he basically called me and said, well, we got to put you on the team. He's like, you do more on social media for us, not on the team, uh, than what back then we had from our team. Yeah. He's like, I have no choice but to put you on the team. <laughs> and, uh, and so they, they kind of connected me with Spro. You know, John Cruz is tied with Spro and, and Kamigatsu. And so that kind of made sense, too, because I... Um, I don't like to talk about myself, but um, I genuinely believe that I help Spro worldwide sell out of their rats. <laughs> no, that's, <laughs> yeah, dude. I, I mean, nobody was buying the Spro rats hardly. Uh, our local tackle store here, the Hideaway Bait and Tackle, you know, Edgar, he, he manages that store. And uh, he told me, he's like, I've had these Spro rats. I had these Spro rats on the shelf for like four years. He's like, <laughs> I even tried to sell them like at half price and nobody would buy them. And as soon as I started posting videos and me catching them on rats and winning money on rats, yeah, nobody could get them. This tackle <laughs> warehouse sold out on them. The hideaway sold out on them. Yeah. Now, obviously, the supply chain and COVID had an impact on that. Um, but guys, I, a lot of guys were buying them because I was posting videos on them. And no, it's super. Like I said, I liked your videos a lot. They're super cool. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm having having a lot of fun with them. Uh, my bucket list item right now is I got to get a calico on a rat, dude. I got. I've seen it. someone do one. A couple guys have done them. Uh, someone did one recently, I think. Uh, I think it was Lunchbox, Lunchbox Tattoos, I think. Uh, he's out of San Diego, but I seen him catch one on a rat. Really? I don't know what it was. Yeah, it was a small one, but there's guys that are catching them on glides. There's, there's. I mean, I'm going to try this year a little more with the glide. Uh, Caesar's got some stuff that I want to throw for the calico. Just finding the right timing, right yeah. places. But yeah, man, next time you're down that way, maybe we can get you out and... Uh, if I'm up back up this way, I, I mean, we'll talk about some stuff we're going to be changing in yeah. the near future for the four year. So uh, thank you again for coming on. I appreciate you coming down. You appreciate and, it. Yeah, uh, thank well, you. I'll see you soon. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right. It's been a pleasure.